Hello and welcome back to Mozart Mondays. Today we're going to look at the third and fourth movements of Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor, finishing off the symphony that we've been looking at so far. Um, we're going to look at these two movements together because they have quite a lot in common with each other and it makes a certain sense to listen to them one after the other. Now the third movement is the minuet and trio. It's in a fast 3-4 time and the opening theme is actually made up of two components. It starts with this rising arpeggio, which then falls back on itself with faster notes. It's almost as if Mozart has three attempts to find this opening theme. It starts, falls back, falls back down, starts a little higher, falls down again, and finally reaches the top. And at that point, the rest of this first theme unfolds. So the whole thing goes like this. those three attempts rising each time and finally it flows over the top. You might also have noticed that that finished with this, this descending chromatic scale, these descending semitones, those were a feature of so much of the other movements that we've talked about so far. We'll return to that in a minute. Now the thing about this opening theme is it's an unusual length. It's three bars long. It has a phrase length of three bars. Um, just a quick word about phrases. Um, this is often a source of great confusion amongst students. Um, when we ask a student how long is the first phrase, they quite often stare at the music and can't quite work it out. Um, and it's always very important to understand how long the phrase is that we're playing. A phrase is like a sentence in any language. And if I was speaking to you as I am in the English language, it's very important that I speak so that my phrases and my sentences make sense. If I were to stop suddenly in the wrong place, it wouldn't make sense. Or if I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, if I go up at the end, you might wonder what I'm talking about. And it's the same in music. So it's vitally important that we do understand the phrase lengths of the music we're playing. The default setting, if you like, the most obvious regular phrase length in a classical music would be four bars. And a lot of Mozart's lesser contemporaries would have been writing in very, very regular four bar phrases, a four bar phrase, an eight bar phrase, maybe a 16 bar, bar phrase. But there's something incredibly predictable about that. Now, I had a look through this minuet and trio, and it's not just this opening three bar phrase that's interesting. First of all, I'll just play you this three bar phrase to show you how it works. So the pulse would be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Those are our bar lines and three beats in each bar. And I'll just count you through the first phrase, first phrase. So it's one, two, three, and again. When you hear the cello parts underneath, you'll hear that they punctuate each bar line very obviously, and those are our three bar phrases. And as I say, Mozart continues to build this movement out of unusual length phrases. I made a little map of all the phrase lengths in this movement, a slightly nerdy thing to do, but it's quite interesting to look at. And you'll see there's some unusual numbers there. We start with two three bar phrases, then we have a fairly regulation eight bar phrase. But this next sentence, the next musical phrase, long phrase, is made up of a three and a three and a seven something you really don't expect to find, and then a nine and a three and a three to finish the minuet. And the trio is even weirder. I'm obscuring my face here, but hopefully you can see some funny numbers in there, finishing with two fives. Now, that map of phrase lengths, it looks more like something you might expect from a composer like Stravinsky than from Mozart. And I found myself asking, why doesn't it sound odd to have all these strange lengths of phrases? I think it's difficult to give a simple answer, but I think the answer partly lies in Mozart's genius, obviously, and the way he's writing. Um, I think he doesn't want to be constrained by obvious four-bar phrases. So although he may not be trying to subvert this, he's following the natural inclination of what he writes. The harmonies are demanding he goes in a certain direction. The melodic flow may demand a certain type of phrase length. And he follows these demands to their natural conclusion. And when we listen to it, that's why it makes perfect sense to listen to. But I think he's also wary of falling into the trap of writing regular phrase lengths that become predictable and possibly boring. There's a famous scene in the film Amadeus where he's sitting at the keyboard imitating different composers and he imitates his contemporary Salieri by playing really obvious regular four bar phrases at the end of which he falls about laughing because it's so funny and so predictable. Moving on to the fourth movement, 
This begins in a very similar fashion to the third movement, with a theme made up of two component parts. And these two component parts become the main melodic material for the entire movement. But these two component parts are actually very similar to those from the minuet. You may remember we started with this rising arpeggio, and then fast notes falling back. Just listen to the beginning of the fourth movement. The two component parts are a fast rising arpeggio, and then quick quavers falling back down again. In fact, if we go back to this opening from the minuet, if you just look at the arpeggios as they rise, you remember there were three attempts at it. And then, and finally, and if we speed that up, there we have the opening of the fourth movement. It's not just a coincidence. I think there's an intentional link here. He could have used different instruments. He could, for example, have started the fourth movement on the clarinets or on the flute or on the cellos in a different register. But both movements start in the violins using exactly the same notes. So that link becomes very, very apparent. And it's very important, I think, that we hear that connection. In fact, if we go on to the second main theme of the fourth movement, there are more connections with other movements that become apparent. You may remember the beautiful second subject theme from the first movement in B flat major. It sounded like this. Something warm and smiling about that. And when we get to the second theme of this fourth movement, not only is it in the same key, but it starts on the same note, and it has a lot of things in common with that first movement theme. Like I say, it's the same instrument, it's the violins again. It starts on exactly the same same note, it's in the same key, and there are certain other similarities that recall that first movement theme. This little rhythm. That's the a little fragment from the first movement theme. And possibly most importantly, they both finish with this yearning, descending, semitone, chromatic scale. Here's the first movement. And here's the end of this theme in the fourth movement. Of course, they're not exactly the same notes, but I think they're similar enough for us to hear that connection. Whenever I play this fourth movement, there's always something vaguely familiar about this second theme. And I think it's obviously that link with the first movement that's still in the back of my mind. Another link with actually all of the movements, but particularly the first and fourth, is the way that this second theme is preceded by an abrupt stop in the music. Music comes to a halt. <laughs> And the same thing happens in the first movement. And it's actually quite unusual for Mozart to do this. He usually writes a rather elegant transition from one theme to the next, whereas here it's almost a clumsy full stop and it gets started again. And it's a particular identifying feature of this symphony. You'll find it in all of the movements. Um, and it's another thing that links the movements together. Finally, when this beautiful theme comes back towards the end, as in the first movement, it's back in G minor. And there's something kind of quietly devastating, as there was in the first movement, about this reappearance in the minor key. It's full of pathos and full of sadness and full of resignation. And the way the symphony ends in G minor, there is something I feel slightly sort of pessimistic about it. Um, dramatic, though it is. So there are a few things to listen out for in these two movements. Um, I've really enjoyed picking these pieces apart over the last few weeks. I always discover something new whenever I start to do this, and this has been no exception. Um, so I hope you found it interesting. Next week, what I'm hoping to do is answer some questions that have been sent in about different bits of Mozart. So if you do have questions, please do send them in. Um, an email will appear um, at the end of this that you can address them to. And I hope you enjoy the remainder of this symphony. Stay well and stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Bye.